Hello everyone, welcome to my webinar, Five Reasons Why You Need a Digital Marketing Strategy in 2023. My name's Ollie. I'm the tech champion for uh, digital marketing and strategy at the Digital Culture Network. And I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas with you today. Okay. Um, this is the Digital Culture Network. Uh, we've got plenty of resources on our website um, and you're able to book a one-to-one -one call with one of our 10 tech champions. So head over to the website and take a look. The aim of uh, the webinar today um, is to give you the inside track on being more efficient and successful when it comes to revisiting your digital marketing strategy. Uh, the topic of strategy is pretty huge, as I'm sure we're all aware, and there are many opinions out there on what the best strategy is and how to design a good one. So for this uh, session, I've tried to distill the topic and extract the value for you uh, to make the subject of strategy less daunting and more useful. At the end of this session, hopefully you will better understand what a digital marketing strategy is and why you need one, how a strategy will improve your chances of success, and some of the key steps involved in planning a successful strategy. Okay, so let's jump into it. So simply put, uh, so what is a strategy? I hear you ask. <laughs> simply put, a marketing strategy is a set of decisions that you either say yes or no to, and it's ultimately the plan that details how you're going to get to a desired outcome, whatever that may be. And it's really important to remember that saying no is as important as the things you plan to do. And it's the saying no that allows you to prioritise and to stay on track. So a really common mistake uh, made by marketers is to confuse your objectives or your goals for the strategy. Uh, for example, if you're looking to reach 10,000 followers on Instagram or you want to increase your newsletter signups by 20% across the year, these are great, however, uh, they are not a strategy as they fail to identify how this growth is going to be achieved. The decisions that you choose within your strategy, for how you reach your decide, the desired outcome, they're going to be different for every kind of business. Um, and they are shaped by your organization's vision, your mission, and your values. So if the strategy is the how, we must first understand what the objectives are and why we're doing it. So, I'd like you to ask yourself, what is your vision? So an organization's long-term vision, as I see it, is its guiding beacon. And this provides clarity and direction so that all of your strategic decisions that you make, they're focused towards this end goal. And there's a nice uh, saying or um, a maxim that you could use is, without knowing the de destination, you cannot plan a route to get there. So I've pulled up Barbican's artistic vision, and I think this is a really clear and concise example of a uh, vision statement. So I believe if you're an employee of, of the Barbican at whatever level, uh, whatever job role you're in, you'd feel pretty confident that you could handle yourself in any given situation using these, uh, these statements as, as, a, as a guideline. So take a moment, ask yourself, is the work that you do on a daily basis aligned with your organization's mission, your vision and value statements? Do you know why your organization exists? Can you recall what your long term aspirations are? And are the decisions you make underpinned by guiding principles or commitments? If not, maybe you want to rethink that and make sure you get clarity. So 
hypothetically, I'd like to, you know, what if you were, what if I was to ask you to climb this very beautiful mountain on, on the screen? How would you go about it? You know, what is your strategy for getting up to the top? There are three fundamental parts to any strategy. First one, having a clear long-term objective. Two, identifying the problems that you may face along the way. And three, coming up with tactics and a plan that enables us to achieve that long-term objective. So a good strategy identifies the challenges that, it must, that must be overcome and designs a way to overcome them. So these handsome chaps here, this is uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, and they were the first people to summit Everest. And they had a really, really clear vision. It was to be the first people to summit the world's highest mountain. They identified the challenges. This was in the form of shifting glaciers, huge crevasses, extreme weather and altitude. Time was a challenge for them. You, you can only survive above 8,000 meters for a couple of days. And also the fear of the unknown. No one had done this before. So what they did is they spent years planning and months of training to design this plan of action that you can see on the screen. And yeah, this to execute this, this, uh, this mission, it took weeks of climbing, various stages of going up and down to acclimatize, all just for 15 minutes to stand at the top of the world. But, but the thing is, the strategies, they can change. Um, in, in, Hillary, in Hillary and Tenzing's day, their main challenge of climbing Everest was the fear of the unknown in this, this above 8,000 meters uh, section. Now, the main cha challenge for climbers is actually getting down alive. So there's far too many people rushing in, there's queues at the top, and if anything were to change, if bad weather came in, you know, and you're stuck at the back of that queue, you're in big trouble. So in fact, it's, it's now more dangerous to climb Everest today than it was in 1953, surprisingly. So anyway, we're gonna to touch on this in part two, on ways to navigate change. So just a quick recap on part one, what is a strategy? So we now know your vision statement lays out the destination. Your strategy is the plan for how you reach your destination. And a strategy typically comprises of three parts, the, the destination, the challenge, and the plan of action. Okay. Welcome to part two. Thanks for staying with me so far. Um, this section focuses on five of um, my most compelling reasons why I think you or your organization should be putting a digital strategy at the top of your priority list. OK, so reason one, a strategy will help you make better decisions. So as we discussed in, in part one, a bad strategy it fails to identify what the, challenge are, the challenges are ahead. So spending time to develop a strategy will help you ensure you're taking everything into account to avoid costly mistakes. That could be launching a, a program or a service or a product in an already cluttered marketplace. It could be failing to understand your own strengths and weaknesses. Or could it simply be making sure that what you're offering is something that people actually want, you know? Um, and a really famous example of this is Blockbuster versus Netflix. And in the 2000s, Blockbuster became irrele irrelevant very, very quickly after not recognizing the, the huge shift in habits to online streaming. And they famously went bankrupt in 2009 after previously completely dominating uh, the video rental market in the UK and in the US. So there are two really important tools for identifying challenges to your organization on a macro and a micro scale. Pest analysis is the zoomed out view of your organization's external influences. 
And this is a tool to help you identify and predict future risk. SWOT analysis, on the other hand, is an internal assessment of your organization's strengths and weaknesses. So these two things in combination, they're a really powerful way to, uh, that allows you to design a plan to limit weakness, capitalize on strengths and avoid threats. Um, they should be conducted on a regular basis and you know, including all your team members really, bring everybody, bring everybody around the table. And you know, this is highlighted uh, with recent news about uh, proposed changes to the data reform bill in the UK. Um, if policy changes and goes through, these uh, these these uh, effects will will uh, affect everybody on the internet, businesses and and users. So it's really important to stay on top of these big kind of shifts in 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 the external environment. Okay, reason two, a strategy will help you navigate uncertainty. So. As, as we all know, the online world is a fairly unpredictable playing field. Media sites can come, they can become irrelevant overnight. And you know, what happens to Buzzfeed, for example, no one uses it anymore. Um, social media algorithms, they're constantly changing. These days, everyone's panicking to be a bit more like TikTok, whereas before it was Instagram and, and, and Snapchat. So, a huge advantage of spending time to develop your marketing strategy is that it will prepare you better if circumstances do change. So when designing your strategic approach, you should be thinking about three main considerations. So a direct strategy. So that is when you make a plan and you stick to the plan. You, you've already identified the opportunities, you know what success looks like, and you execute that plan without deviating. Um, there are pros and cons, obviously, with, with, with anything. But a positive is that you and your team can become really galvanized through having this clear focus. But on the other hand, if circumstances do change, your plans could become irrelevant quite quickly, the, like the blockbuster example. You know. The second consideration is to think about having an adaptive strategy. And the essence of a adapted strategy is, is about monitoring and reviewing, but constantly. So the, you plan to stay agile and don't rely too much on one thing. And it's about um, actively taking time to look and for and find advantages and opportunities as they arise. So an, adap an adaptive approach, sorry, it works really well when you know the environment around you is unpredictable. However, it can mean with this flexible approach that you fail to excel at any one thing, um, meaning you could potentially be at risk for losing that kind of wow factor that the, the direct strategy might have. And the third one the, is the unrealized strategy, and I guess also known as the, the pivot, maybe you might have heard that word. So I like to think of an unrealized strategy as more like a contingency plan, I suppose. Um, it would it would always be advised to give your best laid plans enough time to realize their potential first before trying something new. You know, however, it is particularly now important to recognize that if your strategy has derailed for for whatever reason, rather than continue to kind of dig yourself a bigger hole, just to stop, reevaluate. And design a new plan that is more relevant under the new circumstances that you're in. Okay, reason number three, a strategy will help you find a competitive advantage. So a phrase you've probably heard a lot is the market will sort it out. And to me what that means is what people want will rise to the top and what people don't want will sink to the bottom. So your competitive advantage is really what keeps people interested in what you are offering them. So it's really important to learn what factors are helping you or hurting you uh, in the eyes of 
of your audience. And uh, these can be most easily identified through doing market research. Um, and when considering carrying out doing market research, I'd recommend starting with two, uh, two, two uh, things. So audience profiling is number one, and then competitive analysis. So let's have a look at, look at those a little. Okay, audience profiling. is It's a great exercise to better understand what your audiences want from you. And here's a kind of fun template I've created that looks at the below, at the below criteria, okay? So demographics, obviously that's age, location, etc. Psychographics, this is people's attitudes and values, really more, that's kind of moving more towards that these days. How did your, your audience find you? So one way to maybe think about this is if you have Google, Google Analytics installed on your website, check the referral channels, see what's driving, driving them to your site. What content, what content do they prefer? So again, an, a way to look at this is look at audit your website, audit your social medias, what content is getting the most engagement for you? And so on and so on. So doing this exercise several times to come up with a number of audience personas, this will help you identify what your audience likes about you and how they interact with you. So if you learn, how your audience likes to interact with you, you now know how to communicate with them. So this exercise, it only takes a few minutes. I filled this one in earlier and it took me, what, five minutes? But, but ultimately it saves you so much time in, in the future. Right, second one, uh, competitive analysis. There are many ways uh, to carry out competitive, competitive analysis. But here is a simple process for learning how your organization shapes up. So this is what I like to do. I like to se select a few like-minded organizations to analyze. They could be competitors or they could be organizations that you aspire to be like. Carry out some market research. So run a focus group, for example, you know, get some people around the table, speak to, speak to them about what they like and don't like about these these uh, companies observe your your competitors' features. So, what does their current program look like? How much do they charge? Do they run offers and discounts on a regular basis? And then finally, just look at their marketing. Um, how do they present themselves online? What what is their message, and how do they speak to their audiences? So, once you you know, once you've observed and done your research, now compare these with what, with what you're doing. And what areas do you come up on top on, or what areas do you fall down on? So now with this insight, you can focus on turning your strengths into a point of difference that makes you more unique. And this is what a competitive adva uh, advantage is, um, or a USP, a, a unique selling point. Um, and this matrix on the, on the screen here, is a great way to demonstrate where you fit in within that wider marketplace and to discover what areas present opportunities for you to move into or maybe move out of, in fact. Okay, cool. We're cruising through these. Reason four, a good strategy. Oh, a strategy will help to get everybody on the same page. So a good strategy is largely about creating an environment in which you can get everybody involved on the same page. This could be a small team of two or a large team of 20. It doesn't really matter. So how do you get everyone on the same page, I hear you ask? So I've got four ways um, to achieve this. I want to I wanna show you guys. So number one, the strongest strategies are the easiest to understand. You don't need big, complicated words to detail a plan. In fact, it's the opposite. You want to you want to you want to create a common language that all stakeholders can subscribe to, and which can get everybody singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. And if you can do this, your organisation will instantly become more effective, more efficient, and more resilient too, which is really important. I 
um, have chosen an example from GoPro, who are a brand I'm quite familiar with and, and, and support. Their digital marketing strategy when they launched was really simple and clear. Firstly, they really understood their strengths, which meant they knew exactly who to target and why they might be wanting to use their product. So their, this is their strategy in their words, to encourage authentic, shareable, user-generated content. So if I was on the marketing team at GoPro, I think I could go do that straight away. Like I knew it's very, very simple and clear. In one sentence, it, it, it uh, details the whole, the whole plan that they, they actually executed. So a user-generated content strategy, it was all about right place, right time. So their flagship model launched one year before YouTube launched in 2005. So this was no accident. They knew exactly what they were doing and, and why they were doing it. And they're a huge company now. And this, uh, this image of the, I strapped, I strapped to go to GoPro to a fish, you know, that got 34 million views. So, um, you know, not bad. I'd be pretty happy with that. <clears throat> okay, number two, create a roadmap. So a roadmap helps you to prioritize the actions you need to reach to get to your desired outcome within any within a given time frame. So it puts some parameters around this this plan. Adding milestones within that roadmap is a great way to break up your long term goals into smaller tasks that feel more achievable and less overwhelming. Um, which is really really important when you're working in teams, just to keep people motivated, keep people on track. So, a well-designed roadmap it simplifies the decision making, and it allows you to zoom out and to have that space to identify opportunities when they arise, and to make sure yeah you're you're staying to the plan, or or maybe that you need to you've derailed and you need to reassess or reevaluate. So these kind of plans. To get to get a to get one that's simple and clear, they, it can take time, and typically they do go through many iterations. So don't be put off if you know the first version is is not is not, you know, the, the end product. If you ever do need a sounding board, please get in touch. Book a one-to-one -one with me. Um, details of how to get in touch are on the final slide. Okay, number three, getting everyone on the same page. So. Create smart goals. So smart goals are brilliant ways to add structure and accountability into your bigger picture plan. So I'm sure you've heard of these before, but they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals. Okay. And I like to think of these goals as more like bite-sized jobs. I think the language is nicer there. So, and not only do they help uh, give you that data that allows you to do your reporting and stuff stuff like that the important bits to you know communicate with your with your bosses your directors it also there's some really good benefits to, to having these these goals in place so firstly they let everybody know what to do and by when they also tell us if we are going in the right in the right direction and staying on track they provide us with uh the information we need to optimize our our channels not only that they reduce re repetition you know, you don't need to keep doing the same thing twice. And also, and probably most importantly, in my opinion, is that they provide motivation and they provide purpose. You know, if you're getting up every day, going to work, these goals are, you know, they're, they're great little things to, to kind of tick off and, and kind of cross that thing off your to-do list, you know. My colleague, James Akers, he has a great webinar that he's just done called Why Are You Measuring That? And it covers a lot around how to set up smart goals. It's a great follow on from this. So do head to the Knowledge Hub on the DCM website to, to check that out. I'd really recommend it. OK, number four, get aligned. So better alignment of people, resources, skills, technology. That also means better optimization. So when your strategy is aligned with your capabilities and your goals, everything will start pulling in one direction. So it's also worth noting to, you know, think about making the most out of the talent at your disposal. So 
uh, invest in activities and, and, and work that play to your strengths. Um, in a past role, I was uh, managing a production studio in London and we would try, you know, we put, we put, invested quite a lot of money in, in search, uh, in paid search, but I didn't at the time really know how to, how to use it very well, but, you know, put a lot of money into it, didn't really get much return. But then we kind of reframed it and went back to the drawing board. We found that we had quite a loyal uh, customer base. And so what we did is we, we asked our, our customers to refer a friend. And if they did, they'd get half a price, half price on their next session. So this actually produced really, really healthy numbers and generated loads of business for us. So, and, and not only that, it cost next to nothing because all it was was just speaking to people we were in contact with every day. So I guess my point here is don't feel like you have to do something just because everybody else is doing it. Play to your strengths and look at the talent you have within your teams. And there are three really notable benefits of good alignment. One, people have more time to focus on adding value to what they're doing every day. Basically, they know where to apply their energy better. Two, your teams will become more collaborative. You'll stop working in silos and stop that repetition that might be happening. And thirdly, momentum. Like, momentum is really hard to, to, to generate. If you can generate some momentum, if you're aligned, this momentum will speed up. You become less bogged down with firefighting, those, those daily tasks that, you know, get in your way. All right, on to reason five. A strategy will help you to create more powerful tactics. So to demonstrate tactics that have purpose and have power, we're going to imagine that we are a independent theatre in the southwest of the UK where I live. Um, yeah, and let's let's go into look at some examples. Okay, so example or scenario one. Uh, let's say the goal is to increase awareness of our brand new uh, premises. So if the if the goal is to increase awareness, um, you might want to think about using content marketing as a mechanism for achieving these goals. Uh, content marketing, it works really, really well when there are a blend of owned media, paid media and earned media. So the game here is to figure out what content works best that, to plug in between these gaps. And the, the, the uh, Venn diagram on the screen is a, is a good kind of representation of that. You could also think about using content to drive action at different stages of the funnel. So for example, investing in original content uh, at the beginning of a campaign to uh, generate awareness through PR, to get other people to shout about the, the good stuff you're doing if they enjoy your, your content. On the other hand, you, you could promote paid content further down the funnel at a point that you know people are more likely to convert. So you're kind of, you're not, it's not such a risk in that, in, in that way. So think about content strategically, strategically like that. Okay, scenario number two. The goal is to create a more engaged and active audience. So here are some ideas for how to drive engagement. So you might want to think about applying some behavioural tactics to your messaging, perhaps. So um, these are these are five uh, interesting ideas to, to, to think about. First one is goal dilution. And goal dilution is a thing that does one thing does a better job than a thing that does many things. And I know that is quite a lot of words, but I like to call it the law of hamburgers. And <laughs> so what the, what the law of hamburgers is, is I always trust a restaurant that has very few dishes on the menu, as opposed to one with hundreds of options. For some reason, I trust, you know, if there's too many options, I don't think they can do, cook any of those meals very, very well. And, and uh, yeah, so that, that's the law of hamburgers. That's my, you know, take that and leave it. <laughs> um, the second one is uh, in-group bias. So being part of a group 
actually delivers a high level of emotion. So you might want to think about creating a kind of tight community feel with with your with your marketing. So maybe speak to people like speak to people uh, directly through your newsletters. Uh, uh, run some networking events. Try and find ways to get people together to to kind of feel more positive positively about what you're doing. Third one, scarcity. So also known as FOMO or fear of missing out. Um, try making some of the activi activities you're doing time limited, you know, put a deadline on the end to see if that encourages people to act quicker. Fourth one, endorsements. So favorable influence through the approval of others. Um, as mentioned before, referral marketing is a really good way to, to get people to endorse you through word of mouth. These days, influencer marketing on social media, for example, is, is used a lot as well. So, and, and finally, social proof, which could be thought of as herd mentality, but it's where people tend to um, copy the actions of others. Um, and I guess TV shopping channels are quite a good example of that, you know. Hundreds of thousands of people have bought this toothbrush. You know, it's the best toothbrush in, in the world. And the fact that loads of other people have bought it kind of makes you trust it more, look at it more favorably, okay? So these are just some ideas to, uh, to test, really, when it comes to, to your messaging and engagement. And, oh, sorry, last one. So, last scenario. The goal is to grow the number of signups to your mailing list. So here are some ideas for, for kind of hitting targets and achieving the, 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 those numbers. So if the goal is growth of a database, for example, I like to kind of reverse engineer what the tactics might, might be. So work backwards from the target and then find things that will fill those holes. So using historical data, uh, if you have it available, or otherwise industry benchmarks, you can predict the numbers you need to hit the target along the way. Um, and it's a great way to actually identify the channels that you need to lean on for these activities. So you could ask yourself in this situation, if the signups we need is two and a half thousand, does the channel that I'm going to lean on have enough reach for me to do this. Also, if we need to generate a certain number of clicks through like a, they land on the page and have to go through a, through a form or something, do we need to incentivize this to encourage that action? So, um, another thing you might want to think about is applying A-B testing to parts of the user journey to kind of play on those levers. You might want to think about call to actions testing your, your messaging um, and testing the design of your landing pages. Like these things make a huge difference if you can optimize them. As demonstrated in the graphic, you know, small, small optimizations to, to parts of your, your user journey, they can make big difference to the results if you can find the right levers to play with. And that's all around testing. Okay. So that's it for my five most compelling reasons uh, why you should be thinking about revisiting your marketing strategy. Just a quick recap um, before I go into a quick summary at the end. So just remember that all plans can be subject to good and bad luck. However, through considered research and careful planning, you'll be able to better understand how you shape up capitalize upon your strengths, create contingencies, align your resources, and design robust plans with realistic goals. And if you can do all of these things, or some of these things even, it will help you increase your chances of success. Um, so let's all show some love for being digital marketing pros. And uh, just to, just to finish, a few a few some uh, a few takeaways for you. So, a good strategy it guides you towards your destination. It aligns with the vision, mission, and values. It understand it help you understand the potential challenges ahead. It will leverage 
your organisation's strengths. It will give you clear actions to help you stay on track and it will be coherent throughout your organisation, getting everybody singing from the same mission. Pardon me. So, and um, finally, a bad strategy. What does a bad strategy look like? So it doesn't have clear outcomes, mistakes goals for plans, has not identified the challenges, has not leveraged, it does not leverage your capabilities, it is unrealistic and untimely, and it wastes time, energy and resources. All right, so what's next, everyone? If you would like a sounding board or someone to sense check your work or your, your your current strategy for thinking of revisiting it or if you need a helping hand with any specific area of your strategy email us it's digital network at artscouncil.org.uk um, you can book a one-to-one -one, you can uh, access the resources through our knowledge hub um, and also if you would like any of the templates that have been used in this session yeah, get in touch and I'm happy, to, happy. I will happily share them with you. Um, so, yeah, we have loads more webinars, webinars, sorry, upcoming events, articles on the website. Um, so do join our mailing list. It's it's really good. Once a month, um, loads of good information in there. Um, and if you found uh, the session useful, please do shout about it on your Twitter pages. So thanks a lot. Thanks for sticking to the end and. I'll see you soon.